All right, I'm jealous over this one. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we're going to showcase a dealer that goes by the name The Guitar Broker, but he deals not only in guitars, but even cool classic cars. Needless to say, this guy usually always has some pretty cool stuff. But in searching his website one night, I noticed that he has his own guitar collection of things that he doesn't want to sell. So let's check out my favorites. Starting with this absolute masterpiece. Ah, oh, I love it so much. And that's coming from a guy that doesn't even like football. I'm more of a baseball guy myself, but the fact that we've got a literal pigskin on the top of this guitar is just ridiculous. It's got the stitching for your fingers. It's actually the real material that's used on the real footballs. It's textured the same and all that, even have the lining. And that's such a chef's kiss moment when they decide to put the current Gibson logo when this was made. Because normally you'd put like the Wilson branding on it or whatever brand football that you bought. This would definitely be an interesting one to feel. Now, unfortunately, since that sticks up so far, you could probably only dial the action in so good. And <laughs> it's a wrap tail piece. That way you don't have two things going on here. This is more of a display piece in that aspect. But they have two humbuckers in here, regular control layout. But the fun does not end here. Look at that fretboard. Split parallelogram inlays. You do not see that on a Les Paul hardly at all. The only one that comes to mind is the LP-295, and that's just because it was trying to be a 295. So the fact that we've got an interesting top here with the cool inlays just makes me smile. Now, looking at the face of the headstock, from this photo, it almost looks like that's a satin finish. But besides that, you don't have any other football theming or like Wilson on the headstock or something. And all right, continuing on to the back confirms my theory that I do believe that's a full-on satin finish. Or maybe just not completely fully glued lost over. But if we look at our serial number here, it dates it to 2002. So to put that into a history context here, Gibson was working with pretty much any brand that wanted to work with them to create these interesting promotional guitars, as I've called them. We've talked about the Donzi Les Paul, there's the Playboy iterations. I mean, there's some really strange ones out there like the Yahoo Explorer <laughs> and the Pepsi Les Paul, both of those of which I would happily own. So if anybody's selling one of those Pepsi Pauls, let me know. And I don't even like Pepsi. It's another one of these guitars where it's just so iconic that a USA manufacturer has that guitar. And maybe that's what it is. But it looks like this one also comes with a matching guitar strap here. But you're probably wondering what the story behind this one is. Well, apparently they called this one in the shop the Gibson Les Paul Football Limited Edition, and they made three of these as a collaboration with Wilson Sporting Goods. So again, it's really weird that Wilson is not on this guitar anywhere. So perhaps it was just meant to be like a promo piece to be played at a Super Bowl or something. And maybe that happened and I just don't know about it. Or maybe the project was scrapped. But he confirms here it is an actual leather made top. And nice, he's saying it's actual leather binding. Oh man, I missed that on my first time around. You can see it on the edges. That's beautiful. And apparently Hank Williams Jr. has the prototype of this piece and the other one is still floating out there somewhere. So hey, I mean, if you got a football Les Paul and your price is realistic, I will happily add one of those to my museum collection. But there's a bit more to the story of this one. What's going on at the back of the headstock here? Did somebody take a chisel and just go to town on it? No, that is a road worn stamp. Which if you're not familiar with that, here's an old archive page of it. Unfortunately, the photos are not here, but I'm hoping to make a video on this in the future. But basically, the Gibson Custom Shop was moving its facilities. So they used that opportunity to clean house, essentially, and all the proceeds of this auction went to the Gibson Foundation. So to put that into layman's terms, uh, they auctioned off stuff that they didn't want anymore to get a pretty nice tax deduction and to make their move easier, as well as doing good at the same time. And yes, we actually can look this up. I didn't think it would sell for that much. Wow, 3000 plus 20% premium over top of that. And the reason I'm so shocked about that price is because look at all the other things and what they were selling for back then. A 57 gold top reissue, only 1300. SG Custom with Maestro for 1450. A Custom Shop Elegant for 16. So the fact that old pigskin back in 2006 brought that price tag, there must have been a bidding war. The next one within his collection that I'm jealous of is this. 2003 Gibson Map Quilt Guitar. So you guys have seen the map guitars before, right? Generally, they're pretty boring and plain. Like, yeah, sometimes you find the stars and stripes finish, but you don't have a lot to get excited about. But this one has a quilted maple top 
And I guess you could also say 2003, they were pretty well done with these in the 80s, for the most part, outside of custom special orders. But this one also got fancy inlays with the double stars. Compared to the 80s ones over here, generally you don't find that. And what is that? That's not mahogany wood grain back here. Believe it or not, that's a spruce back. So spruce back, maple top, mahogany neck. I mean, if you're going to own one of these map guitars, it might as well be this one. And in fact, I actually feature this one as the Happy Memorial Day episode of 2018. But no, the reason why this one is special is not because of how beautiful it is. It's because of our serial number here. It hasn't been built yet. It was built in the future. The 26th day of 2023, production number one. How does that make sense? <laughs> well, if I remember correctly, it has something to do with a birthday. Because this was the final map guitar that James Hutchins, you know, the original guy who cut out all the map bodies in the Kalamazoo plant. And if I remember the story correctly, she worked with one of the companies that Gibson partnered with to do like some custom made parts. So when she heard of his retirement, they, they wanted to cook up one last cool one. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us. So five years ago, this was $7,000. I remember it sat for quite some time, but man, I would like to have that one in my collection as the second coolest map guitar in existence. That's right. I'm wink, wink, nodding, nodding at a very, very, very special episode coming up. So if nothing else, it's cool to know where this is. Maybe it'll come up for sale in about 20, 30 years. But now these next ones I'm not as jealous about. These are just really cool and I didn't even know they exist. Look at this, a late 90s Gibson Flying V bass. Apparently this was a custom order by somebody who wanted a Flying V in a bass format with humbuckers. Now I would have figured that these were some sort of a prototypes, but reading his description tells a different story. I mean, they do have Flying V basses back in the 80s, but they weren't necessarily Karina style like this one's kind of going off of. It looks like it's just mahogany, but I could be wrong on that. But besides just this, one. They also have the other one. This time done up in Inverness green, which yeah, that one's a lot cooler. Whoa, that's a strange serial number. 199901. The next one's a pretty interesting Stratocaster, apparently from the 1975 NAM show. We have a very interesting see-through rosin sandwich body with an opaque orange front for half its body and a clear back on the other half. So it's slightly opaque, but not at the same time. So just to see that on a vintage Stratocaster is pretty cool to me. Might not be my favorite Stratocaster I've ever seen, but little dorky things like this. D do you know what that is? Is that a scratch on the front or a reflection? No, that's your strap pin going through the body of the guitar. You can find Dan Armstrong Lucites that are like completely see-through, but this is kind of on a different level, showing their inventiveness, trying to have fun for the NAMM show. So of course it's cool to own stuff like this. Now reading his description, it looks like at one point in time he might have had it for sale for around 25,000. And he had that based off of this one that somebody wanted a quarter million for that was completely see-through, which is very fascinating. Next up is one of the slickest Telecasters I've ever seen. We don't have a full description, and I'm not a Fender expert, but just look at this. Looks like we got one of them DiMarzio humbuckers in the bridge. Pearloid pick guard that's multi-ply, a straight jet black tuxedo finish here. It looks like we just have a white finish for a binding effect, and then we've got some sort of a fancy design on the edges. All this is really tied together by this very light maple neck on it. And not only that, it's got flamed figuring. But then we get to the back and it's all black. So yes, tuxedo vibes. However, I think the front, we need a little bit more pearl weight on the back. That's why this looks so painfully plain as compared to the top that's very aesthetically pleasing in my eyes. But it appears to be some sort of a modern custom shop. So who knows, maybe Fender will make you one if you really want it. But I suppose it is important to note that that is a 1997. So getting one made in 2022, wouldn't it exactly have the same potentially collectible nature to it? Now this one we've talked about before, but it's another cool one that I'm kind of on the fence about for myself. It's actually for sale, this stuff's in the shop, but I think he started this one at 15,000 and now it's down to 10. What makes this really cool is it's a 2550th anniversary Les Paul built outside the 2550 era with a custom color. So this is Cherry Sunburst. You don't find that on that model. The general core offerings were Tobacco Sunburst, Wine Red, Ebony, and then a natural finish. Naturally, having Cherry Sunburst caught my attention the first time we saw this one. But you'll also notice what's one of the main key features of a 2550. It's the first model to have the little mini toggle switch. This one, 
doesn't have that. It still has the sustained sisters on the bridge. It still has the brass nut. It's got the Les Paul anniversary truss rod on it, the special headstock overlay. The back is still mahogany, so we're all right there. But then looking at this neck, here's where you see it's a 1981 serial, which you find the 2550s in 1978. 1979 and yes indeed you do find a few made in 1980 but you don't find them made in mid 1981 so my best guess is this was probably like some sort of a warranty replacement a neck was warped beyond belief that's just a complete educated guess my only thing is it's been rewired and somebody very recently refretted it which is just ah, it makes me so upset like they would have left this all alone i probably already would have made an offer and had this in my collection because it's just that cool but surprisingly it still does have the original tarback pickups so this is a really cool piece if you're not as picky as i am or perhaps i should clarify on that i might say i'm a picky collector but it's when i'm paying top dollar value for collectible pieces like if things have been changed that are non-reversible and the price point's still right i will still make a few exceptions so i think for this one I i'm gonna keep watching it i know somebody's gonna pick it up and i'll be sad one day but <laughs> it's nice to know it at least exists as some sort of a special order Here's another interesting one he's got for sale. This is the 1986 Gibson Les Paul Jr. prototype. Now, whenever I see prototype, I instantly look to the back of the headstock to make sure it's got the impressed prototype stamp right here. And it does. So that makes this really cool. So in the mid 80s, Gibson brought back the juniors. You've got the single cuts and the double cuts, but to make them a little bit better, they shipped them with the ABR1 bridge, which is kind of cool, and a stop bar tailpiece instead of the whole wrap tail. Players really, really like these late 80s, early 90s models because of that unique feature. But at the same time, traditionalists are like, Bleh, we don't want that. But if you want perfect intonation, that's what you want here. It looks like we've got a non-original case on this one. It appears to be in okay shape. That's an interesting strap button placement. I wonder if it has an original one here and somebody's moved that, or if they went like vintage Melody Maker on us. I like the finish of that. So if you're thinking, hey, only six and a half thousand dollars, 80s prototype, this is just not that popular of a model in general. I would have some interest in owning that as far as like a future display piece. And then lastly, we've got this interesting Gibson Les Paul Studio done up by Rick Garcia. Interesting artwork. I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but I thought I would show it to you guys just because it, it was unique. You got some sort of black lines, a little bit of like a lamp vibe going on here, a little bit of blue squigglies. But Garcia, if you're not familiar, he's a well-known artist from Miami, which is very close to where this dealer is. So he ranks pretty high up in the art world. So this one, being a Les Paul studio, it should not be $6,000. But because of the artist, we're trying to blend the art world with the guitar world on this one. But for me, it's all about that back. It's a shame it's a two-piece back, but this wood grain, yeah, I like that. But it appears to be a late 2003 model. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode checking out Craig Brody's guitar collection. He's got some pretty cool stuff. You can find him on Reverb. Check him out on his own website, guitarbroker.com. Not sponsored to talk about him today. I just thought he had some cool guitars. And if you enjoyed this episode and there's another publicly posted guitar collection you'd like me to go through, feel free to leave a comment. Take care. If you enjoyed my commentary on his collection, how about you check out the commentary on my collection from last year, the 2021 year-end video. Sure, the audio's not that good, but the visuals, the visuals are there.